changes and swings within the oil industry and what's happening in oil right now. And uh, tonight, uh, what we have is David Blatcher, who is the managing, uh, is, a, is a founder and managing partner of DB Global Energies Consultants. He helps clients assess their goals, create the customized strategies, connect with the right consultants, overseas contract and workflow. He's also the president of WTM Energy Inc., Permian Basil uh, Oil and Gas Producer. Um, he actually has been in the oil industry for over 40 years. He works in Alaska, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, once again, David, thank you so much on getting on the Zoom call tonight um, to talk about what's happening in oil. I definitely want to appreciate you during this period of time. Happy, happy to do so, Jason. Thank you for the invitation. All right, definitely. Uh, first and foremost, I want to know is um, how has coronavirus really affect oil? That's the question I think we all want to know. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. And it's not only the coronavirus, of course, that has depressed the demand for uh, oil and, and gas, let's say oil and natural gas, fossil fuels in general, I and mean, that would include coal as well. But, but in the case of oil, you know, it's been a confluence of events. It's been not only the uh, coronavirus, uh, but it's also been the um, kind of battle, if you will, between um, Saudi Arabia and, and Russia. Um, and, and, you know, by battle, I mean, it's kind of who's going to be the dominant supplier of oil going forward. Now, the, the coronavirus, of course, has caused such a, a, um, a, a squeeze on the supply in terms that nobody's using it, right? The demand's not there. So if the demand's not there, then you start to immediately get excess uh, supply. And how the industry has handled that is by cutting back on the production and also storing oil in any container basically they can find. I mean, they've filled up all the, the, VV, the very large uh, carriers, the tankers. I mean, you look at pictures of, and see those in, in the Gulf of Arabia, you see them in, in the Gulf of Mexico here, you see them anchored right offshore in California in, in Los Angeles. And, and they're just absolutely chocker block full. Um, now they're, they're doing quite well. I mean, when in normal times they would charge maybe $25,000 a, a day to, you know, buy it. If some buyer or trader want to store some oil for, you know, a few days or a month to try and make a little bit of a margin on that, they charge about $25,000, $30,000 a day. These tanker companies, now they're charging like $150,000, $200,000 a day. So it just shows you um, the vast oversupply. So coronavirus has really had a, a dramatic effect in demand, which has then caused an oversupply in oil. And, and you saw the price of oil in West Texas go negative uh, about six weeks, two months ago. And, and the reason for that, of course, it wasn't, it wasn't that they were, people used to say, oh, it's gone negative. Are they going to give away oil and gas. No, no, they're not going to do that. It's just the paper that for the May contracts back in March, um, it, it was just, there was no demand. So it actually kind of went negative on paper for a while. So, so that's been the main uh, impact that, that uh, the coronavirus has had on, on the oil right now. Got it. Now with, with the price, with this swing, how's that going to affect American oil companies, are we going to see some of them file for bankruptcy? Will we see more mergers? What do you see what's going to happen in the, in the oil, U.S. shell oil companies? I think it's a bit of both, Jason, to be honest. I mean, we've seen some of the uh, West Texas producers like Pasley Energy file for bankruptcy. Um, you see a lot of the smaller, very small, let's say, micro um, cap companies or even the privately owned companies um, shutting in their production. I mean, they're, they're actually just saying, you know what, I'm going to shut the production in. Um, and these are, these are called stripper wells where maybe you get like one or two barrels a day out of a well. Um, and it's just not worth it uh, when you're at, you know, $10 or $15 a barrel. Uh, so what you're seeing, though, is some other companies is that um, they're loaded up with debt because drilling these, you know, we've, we've heard, I'm sure you and, and all of your uh, uh, clients and interested uh, guests here, have heard of these shale wells, these long horizontal fracking shale wells. Uh, they're, they're not cheap to drill and, and, to, and to frack and to uh, maintain. 
and they have a very, very short lifespan in terms of their peak production. So what that means is that you, you, you have to spend eight, 10, $12 million per well, and it, it takes you a while to get it back. So you're, you're constantly on a treadmill of having to drill, 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 drill to pay you know, the loan you took a year, 18 months, two years ago to drill the, the previous wells. So a lot of those producers are, are really hurting right now. And they're, they're, the, some of them are in you know, negotiations with the, the bondholders uh, to get a bit of relief. And some of them, you know, are just declaring um, protection under bankruptcy. Um, now, the bigger companies, you know, the Occidentals, the Chevrons and that, um, they'll, they'll do okay. Uh, you've seen Apache, for example, Apache shares drop down to $4 a share. Um, you know, around March, March 23rd, 24th, 25th. Uh, but it's back up now to about $12 a share. Um, so, you, you know, th there are examples of companies that um, if they've got cash flow from somewhere else, like Apache has cash flow from Egypt and the North Sea, they're able to sustain their operations in the U.S. here. And similarly with the big companies like the Exxons or Chevrons and that, they have actually production sharing contracts internationally that can sustain them through these difficult times. But for the pure play, let's call them the pure play, like the pioneers, the EOGs, the Pasleys, these kind of guys, they're, they're, they're hurting right now. They're, 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 they're definitely hurting. And there will be mergers. I mean, I can't help but think that, you know, companies like Exxon, Chevron, remember Chevron missed out on the uh, Anadarko um, acquisition. Uh, Occidental got it instead. That was partly funded by Warren Buffett. Um, so, you know, but there's companies like Chevron that are going to be out there hunting. They're going to be out there going like, ooh, what do I see that I would like to buy? <laughs> you know, so that's really what's going on right now in, in the U.S. is that is that a lot of companies, as you said, are going to go under, and there's there's likely to be as we go through the rest of the year here some mergers taking place, acquisitions. Okay, and I think yesterday I was watching the news about Russia, not Russia, but Venezuela and Iran. So what's going on with Iran and Russia in this whole mix? Well, Iran, as you know, have got sanctions on them, so it's very difficult for them to sell oil. Um, they have to do sort of little backdoor things with selling, mostly to Southeast Asia and Asia is where they sell most of their oil to. Um, but that, you know, overall is putting a, a, a a damper on supply because you know if Iran were to go full bore on the open market we'd have we'd be awash with oil and similarly with Venezuela Venezuela is you know they're, they're they've got sanctions imposed on them um, in terms of you know oil field equipment going down to Venezuela to you know make repairs on wells and pipelines and things like that uh, and they've also got you know financial sanctions on them you know, you know, of course, I don't have to tell you this, but I mean, it's, it's all, all the money flows through New York, right? Everything denominated in dollars and oil is denominated in dollars. Some of the countries are looking to, to denominate oil in euros, like Syria, for example, denominates oil in euros. But by and large, it's all denominated in, in dollars. And so, you know, if, if the, uh, the U.S. Treasury wants to get tough about it, they'll, they'll slap sanctions on them. And that's what's happening with Venezuela and Iran. So I think, I think that the, one of the takeaways there, Jason, is really to say, you know, look out for Iran and Venezuela. And I would also add Libya into that because Libya has a tremendous capacity to produce oil. And right now they're in a civil war. You know, you've got General Hattar out in Benghazi and you've got the, the, the UN backed government in Tripoli. But if that ever gets resolved, so if you have the, so sort if of you have Iran, Venezuela, and Libya all sort of, you know, coming on together, and um, you, you're going to see a huge a surge in, in supply. Mm. And how does, and with that use, if that does happen, how will that surge uh, affect the average American person when they go into the pump? Well, it, it's, it's kind of a, if you think about it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's great for the person going to the pump, like all of us here, right? I mean, we can go and and we can buy, you know, at California, I know there's pretty high taxes, but in Texas, they're pretty low. So, you 
know, we got down to like a dollar twenty or something a gallon here, dollar ten. I think one <laughs> of them was one of them was like under a dollar for a couple of hours or something. But but you know, it, it's uh, but barring the taxes and that, you'd see a tremendous drop in the uh, in, in the price. Now, the the only thing that might impact that is if if you had a cohesive OPEC or an o, OPEC as they call it, OPEC plus, right, which is the traditional OPEC members, you know, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, all these, but then you also added in now the plus is Russia and, and Norway. Um, and so, but if you had the, let's say the OPEC plus plus that also um, involved Iran again and all that, you'd see a, a tremendous flow of, of uh, oil supply, but you know, like, you know, if they're not happy with the price and they all agreed, they could all cut production and drive the price up. But I, I think all things being equal, I think that, you know, if those countries got back online, you would see them uh, just pump as fast as they could to make revenue for, for the, their country treasury. And, you know, that you'd be flooded. You'd be flooded here. I mean, very, very low prices of oil and natural gas. Um, and particularly the oil, uh, you know, the, the one thing that occurs to me, we've had this discussion internally in the business here is that that's, that's almost what, you know, a lot of the people that are uh, promoting renewable energy, like wind and solar and that, hate to hear because what they would like to see is the price of oil be really high so that it would make things like wind farms and solar and these other things economic. But if you've got the low price of oil, it does the opposite. Everybody says, "Hey, I, I'm, I can buy oil, I can buy gas at the pump, for two bucks. Well, why do I want, you know, electric car?" <laughs> so, so right. it's, it's always a right. It's always one of those balances. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, that that's that's what I would say on on that uh, topic of Venezuela and Iran and that. Yeah, you, you got with these low gas prices, I can see less and less people being excited or intrigued about looking at Tesla and going back to looking at a traditional Ford or, or a traditional gasoline car, which is interesting. With all this turmoil with all these different countries, could you, we possibly see a war happen between some of these countries even further than we're seeing right now? Or um, You know, that's always a possibility, um, but I, I kind of doubt it. You know, a lot of the wars now are, are, are kind of, you know, Kind of under under the surface, right? They're all hacking and all this, and and they're economic wars a lot and trade wars. Um, now, you know, we've seen a lot of the wars recently um, be over politics. I mean, the whole Arab Spring was nothing to do with oil; it was to do with, with the politics and and the, the the repression. You know, of course, a lot of people I know in Egypt kind of yearn for the days. They wish they were back in the Mubarak days because, uh, you know, right now it, it, it's a bit of a different regime. But, but, but the point is, is that um, I, I don't, I mean, the only thing that could really trigger a war would be like Iran blocking the Straits of Hormuz um, and, you know, um, getting into it, the Saudis and the Iranians getting into it. But, you know, they both have a lot more to lose than they do to gain. I mean, even Iran, um, you could you could argue Iran doesn't have as much to lose as Saudi does. That's probably true. But on the other hand, you know, you saw that heightened tension back around January 10th or 8th or 10th when that missile was fired at the refinery, and then and then you know the U.S. threatened, and then the Iranians shot down that airliner. I think it was was from Belarus or something like that. Anyway. They, you know, so tensions can get high, but it, it's I may, maybe, you know, maybe it's wishful thinking on my part, but, but I don't think, I don't think it's going to lead to war. I, I don't think oil as oil is going to lead to war. I think it's going to be more political, politically driven than, than mm -hmm. just purely um, being, you know, a war. We used to say, oh, the war is being fought over oil. There's so much oil out there right now. I don't, you know, I just don't see um, that that happening. Mm. What do you see future prices for oil? Do you see the future prices of oil staying low, or do or you see more volatility, or prices eventually rise? How do you see the oil future prices? Man, if I could predict that, I'd be I'd be rich. I'd be. I'd have a house over on uh, Hawaii. And, uh, no, it's 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 a tough game, man. It is tough. 
I, I have a client I'm working for right now over in over in the UK, and and you know, um, uh, one of their one of the one of the other companies is trying to help them out in in evaluating this this acquisition, which is about a billion dollar acquisition they're looking at. I'm doing a lot of the technical work, and this other company is saying, "Ooh, it's going to be really low price for the next two years," and, and I'm pushing back, and you know, they're paying me to advise, and I'm saying, you know. I think that's a dangerous thing to, to say is that the oil price is going to be 25 bucks for the next two years, because you know, if you get a surge in demand here, we get through this coronavirus, we're, we're in, you know, we're all experimenting together, right? With this you know, reopening down here in Texas. Now I was out this afternoon. I thought, man, there's just like, it's like rush hour. You know, it's just, I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, but people are, People are getting back out. And so you're going to start to see things ramp back up. And whether or not we have a phase two or three or we have a resurgence in infections remains to be seen. But, but I think, if I'm answering your question right, I think that the near term is probably going to be, you know, relatively low, maybe $25, $35 a barrel. But then once things kick up, you're going to see those traders trading out on December futures and and then futures into into 2021, and, and I, I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be higher. I think you know you're going to get back up to 50 bucks a barrel, rel a lot quicker than maybe we think. That 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 would be my, you know, my my kind of guess on that. Right. And what's the magic number for U.S. barrel oil producers? Is it 35 dollars or 50 dollar barrel? What's the magic number for U.S. oil producers to make money? Well, for U.S. oil producers. To say those those long horizontal wells that they frack and everything else. I mean those those got those are expensive wells. So you know they need thirty five forty forty five dollars a barrel to to break even. Um, now a little producer like me, you know I I can I'm just I just produce a few barrels a day. I can I can get by on you know twenty five thirty bucks a a, 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 a barrel. Um, some of the larger companies like the Exxons and that, and that uh, they have some pretty low operating costs around, you know, mid teens to low twenties um, cost per barrel to produce. So for us producers in particular, they're kind of broken up to these shale, you know, producers, these frackers as they call them. Um, they need a lot higher. They need 35 to $45 a barrel, but for what we call conventional, oil producers that basically drill vertical holes and you just kind of do it the old fashioned boring way. Um, their costs will cost are a lot less. Um, mm. Even, even, even offshore stuff that, you know, to drill it and, and then to, to, to set these offshore production facilities. I mean, it can cost like, man, two, three, four billion dollars just to get started. But once you're flowing and, and it's a continuous flow, you can drive down those costs. Um, so, but, but in general, that's what I would say for conventional stuff, sort of 15 to 20, 25 for those frackers. It's more like 35 to $45 a barrel. Mm -hmm. And then have, do you know how many people they're expecting in the fracking industry to be laid off until this, to the oil kicks back up? I've, I've read and numbers anywhere from half a million to 2 million. Um, I don't know which one to believe exactly, but I think it's more probably around the half million right now in, in Texas. Um, you know, there, I think a lot of the service companies are, they just put their equipment aside and they furloughed their workers. Um, some of the bigger companies, I mean, I know back in, I guess it was February or March, even Apache had a big layoff, 150. That wasn't, you know, that's not huge, but you just add up all those 150 here, 300 there, you know, without, and pretty soon it adds up to real numbers. And, um, and, and so what, what a lot of these uh, oil field workers are doing, um, I say oil field, that's in the field itself where they're going out. They're the ones that are turning the valves and, and doing everything. I mean, uh, they were getting, they were flying pretty high there for a while, but right now I think they're just hunkering down and, a lot of the a lot of the guys I know that were in that position, it's like anything else, right? You had the smart ones that were saving money, and um, you know, saving money and 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 
like they were able to like buy a little business on the side or, or one guy was buy, bought like an apple orchard or something, you know, and they're, they're okay. And then, then the, then the other guys are like out there at the bar every night and spending every, every dollar they kind of made, you know, so, right. so you get that split, but I mean, in general, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's been a big, a big a downturn here recently, but again, once that price pops back up, they're going to, they're going to suck all those folks back in. Mm, okay. What do you see the future impact on electric cars and solar power on the oil industry? Well, I mean, as I say, I mean, the, the, the electric cars are, are great. They're fun. They're, I mean, I've driven the Tesla. It's an awesome car. I mean, it's like, how cool is that? Um, but, but it, it really is, um, you have to get the electricity from somewhere, right? So, right. You know, there's, there's a principle of, of physics that think it's the second law of thermodynamics, which says you cannot create energy and you cannot destroy energy. So you, you've got, energy has got to come from somewhere. Right now, the electricity in the U.S., most of it comes from burning coal, oil, or natural gas. Um, far outweighs anything else. Uh, globally, I think the renewables depend on who you, who you believe, around 5%, 4 or 5% percent renewables um, uh, versus, you know, to generate electricity and, and to power the world. Um, so if you want to get to scale where renewables will really have a big dent in the demand for fossil fuels, you, you're going to have to drive the prices way down, get the efficiencies way up. Like right now, solar is, we call solar like real time because you know, the, the, there's batteries, but they still don't have the, the huge capacity. So what, you know, what we're looking at is, which call, we call it distributive renewables. And what I mean by distributive renewables is that you have places like, you know, um, I've worked with the, with the um, outfit called Switch Energy Alliance. Uh, we've done work down there where in a, like in a village in Colombia where they had no power they never had had any power, um, but that's a, that was a perfect place. We put up solar panels, a big array of solar panels, and we had some batteries in there. Um, and what, what did they need it for? Well, they didn't need it. They didn't want it in their house. They wanted it in their, their lodge or their common house, and they wanted it to power a refrigerator so they could keep medicine in there. Uh, but that's a perfect place for solar and renewables. But if you're going to try and run you know, the Bay Area and that, it just, it won't happen. So as far as right now, we, we in the industry, there's companies like Shell and BP and others that are, are kind of turning towards more renewables, uh, but they're going to have to do it at scale. They just can't, you know, do renewables to um, provide power to a, you know, village in, in uh, Colombia or we did something in Nepal and, and this sort of thing. It's, it's going to take a real, a real, let's say, paradigm shift or a real breakthrough technology. Um, you know, maybe Elon Musk will come up with it, you know, and this, this battery factory in Nevada. I mean, um, then, it'll, then it'll be a threat. But again, it, it's, when, 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 we, when we think of it as being a threat, we'll always need oil and gas, right? When, when we talk about renewables, we're mostly talking about for electricity. And and your and your guest who asked the, the impact um, is is you know is exactly right. The electric cars, it's a great application for for that. It's just you have to ask yourself where's the electricity coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, oil is a great oil. oil you, you look around you where you're sitting, where you are, you know, you, the screen of your computer. I mean, it's all from oil derivative. I mean, oil is a, is a, mir a modern day miracle. You know, I mean. It, it's got, it is an unbelievable what we do with oil. I mean, it, in terms of the product and we, we always think about burning it, but so much of it is used to make everything um, good we have, but also unfortunately everything bad like pro plastic bottles and plastic pollution. But I mean, if we can figure this out, I, you know, we'll be okay. So I, so I guess the message is, I think there's room for both renewables and, and, and oil. And that's what the Switch Energy Alliance is all about. And, and the other thing I would 
I would um, encourage your listeners to do is there's a new movie out um, on YouTube and it's the executive producer is Michael Moore. I think you, you've probably heard of Michael Moore. He's made films about, you know, a lot of stuff about, it's called gas land and all that, but he's the executive producer and the, the actual director of the film by Jim Gibbs. And it's about renewables. It's called planet of the humans. You're, you're smiling. I, I seen it. I've seen Did it. you see that? I yeah. have seen it. I was wondering about that. Man. Because he, <laughs> he killed, he destroyed all my, our thoughts about how we're being so good as being, well, I guess you could say tree huggers that mm-hmm. it seems like, yeah, it just seemed like it's not actually happening. You know, that's why I wanted to know your thoughts. What, we, yeah. what was he saying actually true or not when it comes to oil or is it? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that, you know, um, we, we, you know, we've been saying this for, for years is that, you know, the solar panels that you see, whether there's on you on your roof or, or, you know, these big arrays in the desert are all made in China, you know, and, and to, to do that, they're having to, to mine using fossil fuel and diesel with their, their big uh, shovels and scoopers and trucks and everything. And having to blast furnace it down, melt it down, to make these, so what we've done is the U.S. You know, we say, oh, the U.S. emissions have dropped, you know, like 20 percent, 15 percent in the last 10 years. Well, yeah, that's because we've exported all our producing, uh, or our production of of uh, solar panels to China. So they're they're making the emissions, not us. So I think it's, um, but it's one atmosphere, right? It's one yeah. atmosphere. And, and that's something that, that this guy, Jim Gibbs, was, was talking about when he was saying about biomass, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so there's a lot of moving parts to it. But Definitely. Do you think right now that big purchases of oil, such as government, airline companies, they should be edging by as much oil as, as possible right now with the prices being so low? I, I, think, I think they are. They've got the, the financial ability to do it. Uh, they're, they're going to be hedging, especially the airlines and stuff, um, and looking for that bounce back. Um, I'd certainly do that. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, you know, on, on the flip side, I know companies that in the last year and the last year and that um, they were buying, you know, they're hedging their production as well. So there's mm-hmm. companies out there and I, I you know, you, you can look it up, I'm sure, in their 10Ks or something, but I mean, you know, there, there's companies out there that are hedged at fifty, sixty dollars a barrel. So as long as those collars and hedges stay on, they're they're, they're okay. But uh, but yeah, I, I definitely think that if you're an airline and uh, transportation, that you'd be you'd be wanting to to buy some futures in, in gasoline and uh, jet a aviation fuel and stuff like that. Definitely. Now, what happens if one of those airline companies do fold? You know, there's a lot of talks that one or two of these. Uh, airline companies might fold in the September, October um, during this period of time or run out of cash. What would happen to the oil oil industry here in America or worldwide at that point? Um, I'm not sure a whole lot would, to be honest, I, because I think that, you know, um, there, there's enough airline capacity out there that they could probably pick up the slack. You know, let's say, unless it's a big airline like, you know, American and United, I mean, their routes are so expansive that it, it would be tough for you know one of these smaller outfits to to pick up the slack on that especially domestically but but i think you know if it was someone like a ryanair or you know maybe an iberia air or you know somewhere like that the foreign that you know there, there's other companies that are ready to step in um that can actually to be honest fly cheaper um like emirates you know and things like turkish air they're I don't know if they're actually subsidized. I think they're subsidized, but they're able to sustain, you know, a, a lot more losses, if you will, um, and, and still still operate. So, but in the U.S. specifically, um, you know, again, I, I think it would be, you know, you'd have to have somebody folding like United or American um, in order to make a, a huge impact. Okay. Now, since I'm a betting man or I'm a veteran, I should say, when you look at oil and gas, where would you say it's the smart money being invested at right now? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I wish I knew exactly. Um, but but I 
think I think again, you know, if you're looking for um, a whole lot of growth, or if you're looking for value, or you're looking for dividends and things like that, I mean, I think that um, I, I think that you know, it, it's tough to go wrong. I haven't checked prices today, but but I mean, it's tough to go wrong with companies like Exxon and Chevron, and and you know, um, I still look at Pioneer as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think that those ones were always good go to, you know, BPs mentioned. So I, I think that um, th those are the kinds of companies you want to look at for stability. Uh, you know, if you want to take a flyer on things, you know, look at these producers in, in uh, West Texas. Um, some of them I haven't checked lately, but I mean, a few names are EOG, Pioneer, um, Apache, um, Clayton. There, there, there's a there's a lot of companies out there that, that you can screen and, and just see you know how they're doing I mean I you know I myself I mean I, I should have known better I was, I was I was talking with a couple of people about when Apache was at four bucks a share and I said you know god that's how can it be that low you know their market cap was like under a billion dollars and they had been a you know I mean at their peak they're like 45 billion but I said god I, I gotta jump in there and buy some but they're the the these people I was on the call with, they're like, oh, no, you know, I don't know. It's how long is this going to last? And you kind of hesitate, hesitate. But, you know, they went up three times. So if I put 5,000 bucks in there, I'd, I'd be pretty happy right now. But I think there's still those opportunities out there. Um, mm. You know, there, there are. There's still opportunities out there. Uh, as long as they're a good company, they're solid, I think those, those are ones to go for. Okay. Definitely. And is there any bailout programs or, or are there any bailout programs that the oil industry is acting for right now with all these CARE Acts and all these HEROES Act and all these new stimulus packages that the oil industry in America try and go after? I've heard that they are. I've heard that they are approaching it, but I also think there's a lot of political baggage with that. You know, it's all like a hot potato. Who's going to, you know, I mean, in general, uh, the American public doesn't have a very high regard of oil companies. And so, I think it would be politically very tough for, you know, Democrats or Republicans, uh, uh, anyone, quite frankly, to go to bat for oil companies. Um, so, but, you know, there's other mechanisms with, with, with bankruptcy and protection, things like that. But, but I know that there have been some discussions with the, with the government about that. Um, but I, I'm not... A, I'm not personally aware that anything has moved much beyond just talk at this point. Um, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't know, you know, I, for me, it, it's all about this whole, this whole care package thing is all about, about workers and employees. You know, I mean, I was talking to a, to a guy in California, he's a dentist out in uh, Walnut Creek Concord area there. And, and, you know, he says, God, I'm shut down, you know, and I, he's got all these employees and he, he got offered a loan, $75,000 loan and, and, or 80,000. And they said, well, 75,000 or 75% of that has to be for your employees. So he called his employees and they're like, no, we don't want your money because we're getting great unemployment. <laughs> they're, they're doing okay. So he's, he's, you know, he said, well, I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to take this loan because my employees are, are doing, you know, they're doing, thankfully, they're doing okay on, on unemployment. And if he used that money for anything else to pay his, the lease on his dental office, he, you know, he'd have to pay it back. You know, it just, it wasn't working. So, you know, th there's probably in anything like that, there's always strings attached, right? It, it I mean, we, maybe we all got checks in the mail for, thousand bucks, whatever it is, you know, and we're happy about that. And there's no strings attached, but for companies, man, there's always strings attached to that sort of thing, you know? Right. So with the oil companies, I, I don't think, you know, they're asking for it, but really, I don't know if they'd even really want it. <laughs> that's, but I, I'm not, that's just me talking. I don't know. Right. When you look at the oil industry right now, is there any minority players do you see? And if not, how, or how can we get, how do you see, yeah, is there any minority players in the oil industry that you see? And how can my, more minorities get in the oil industry at this point? Minorities in terms of just minority shares or minorities in the business? or what Minorities in the business. business. Yeah. No, that's, you know, uh, 
That's that's the thing. As there's there's a lot of jobs out here. There were a lot of jobs. Let's say let me backtrack here. Were there were a lot of jobs in 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 the business, and um, it's just a matter of of applying and having the right skills. It's all yeah. about skill set. I mean, to to be quite honest, you know, I've been in this business forty years. Um, when I was starting out working in Alaska in the in the seventies and that, we had a lot of our crews were from. Louisiana and Texas. And so we had, we had a lot of minorities. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I, I you just, you know, it, it, it was just, that was because that Louisiana and Texas is where kind of the center of the oil business was right in the South, uh, Southeast U S Southwest mm -hmm. Southeast. Um, so it, it's really a matter of you know, going in there and deciding you, do you want to get a, first of all, do you want to get a degree in something like, engineering, petroleum engineering, or geology, or something like that, or do you want to go and work kind of on the rigs? Um, you have more of a mechanical inclination um, to, you know, if, you, if you're a welder, or you're a good, you know, good with tools and, and fixing, um, you know, machinery, and all that stuff, there, there's a demand. There's, there, there's definitely a demand. Like, like I say, not right now, but in the oil business, there, there's, there's definitely a demand. And okay. so I haven't seen, and I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being a bit ignorant, but I haven't seen um, myself any, any sort of restrictions or, or kind of roadblocks or anything put up, um, you know, and, and I've, I've worked overseas for 25 years and, and certainly, you know, I've worked uh, Asia, Europe, Africa, South America. And, and, you know, it's just, I mean, it, it's, you got to have the willpower and you don't, you, you can't, you can't just kind of give up. You got to, you got to keep pushing at it, you know? Right. And how hard is it to get in some type of form of ownership in the oil industry? Is it very hard as far as ownership wise to get into the industry or like a good old boys network or how is it really ran? It, it kind of is in a way, although what the way I started this little production company out in West Texas was that you know, you, you, we had five of us, um, just go in there and say, you know, we, we have worked for companies all our lives and we decided maybe we can do it better. So we went out and looked for some, you know, 10 barrels a day to, to, to buy. And so we went poking around, kicking tires and, and, you know, uh, there's always somebody who's got some land for sale. You know, we looked at stuff that some old boy from, you know, 80 years old or 90 or whatever, and he's wanting to sell out and all that. And, and so, you know, and then, then another guy, you know, you can get in there and, and, you know, like one of the owners we're in was, he said, Hey, you know, I need to, I need some, somebody to invest some money. Cause I got these, these wells I want to drill and I can't really swing it right now. So you go in there and you invest with, with, uh, with him. So that's what we've done right now. Um, we've done a few kind of um, projects to try and increase the, the uh, production level. And, you know, what I've had several people come to me and say, Hey, you know, I'd like to invest with you. And I'm like, well, that's great. But let me, let me prove the concept first. <laughs> you know, let me, let me make sure I can make money in this because I don't want to be, you know, taking your 20,000. And then a year later I say, Oh, well, that really didn't work. I want to, I want to get proof of concept here. And then when that works, then I'll, then I'll come at you and say, you know, that this is what I, this is what I think it's, it's worth doing now. But, if you want to get in, there's a lot of scams out there. So what I would say is be very, very careful in, in what you do. Um, and, and so, you know, you'll have people call up and say, hey, I got this great deal and, you know, 20,000 bucks, you can get in on this. Well, it, it may be a pure scam, but, but then it may be that it really is something like that. But it's on an unproven concept where they're going to drill out a well, they're going to spend a couple million to drill a well. And it's just a very, very high risk deal. Um, so, you know, you don't want to do that. And so that's when, so if you are going to invest, make sure that it's in something that's a proven concept. Uh, make sure you vet whoever it is that you're going to invest with on that um, and just run all the traps. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of lawyers out here in the oil field, um, whether it's here in Dakota or California, whatever, and, you know, it, it's like insurance money. You just pay 1000 2000 bucks to get 
get get a, a oil and gas lawyer to check all the the deeds and the papers and everything and okay then that's fine so but that 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 would be the advice I would give okay that's good information to know especially for oil right there now I know there always was talks that the government always subsidized oil industries by giving them subsidies even when there was record profits why did why did the government usually give subsidies um, to the oil industry over these years was there, what was the government benefit from doing that well that was a that was i mean it, it, there still are some of those uh, subsidies are really they come in the form of tax breaks um, and you know there's there's there was a tax break on wellhead production because you have to remember right right now we are u s is producing or they can produce, we can produce as much as Saudi Arabia right now, like 10 million barrels a day. But it wasn't that long ago that we were importing a lot of oil. And so the cost of importing oil and being dependent on that oil always kind of made our, the government nervous because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough, <laughs> you know, I'm old enough to remember uh, the, the uh, they called it the Arab oil embargo where they just shut gas off. They just shut the, the, the flow of oil. And, um, you know, I, I get my little 63 Ford Falcon and drive up and you'd have to wait in line for a couple of hours. And so that really stuck in the conscious uh, psyche of, of the U.S. government and the policymakers. And so part of it was that they were trying to incentivize oil companies to produce more, to produce more oil, because they want, the U.S. goal has always been to be energy independent. And, and that's one reason. And, and the other reason too are, are old, like, you know, I don't, you know, there were some old subsidies on things trying to incentivize, you know, companies to go out where nobody else had. And, and they, they like the BLM, the, the Bureau of Land Management would lease them land really cheap. And that was kind of a form of subsidy as well. Um, but that, you know, anymore, that's kind of dropped off. So, um, and, and there are tax breaks on, on there that, that like maybe a lot of industries have tax breaks. I mean, remember, remember it wasn't too long ago um, that, that the, you know, solar panel producers got, you got tax subsidies, right? You got tax breaks and that was to encourage you to buy solar panels, encourage you to, to do this sort of thing. And, and, and you even, I think you even got a credit early on buying like an electric car as well. So. You, huge one in California for electric cars. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So it, it's not dissimilar to that. And, and I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't defend any subsidies for the oil business, um, but, but that's kind of the background um, as far as I, I remember. Right. Do you see us will be oil independent in the future in the United States? Will that ever become a dream come true like they said 10 years ago we will be or? That's just a pie in the sky dream. No, we're, we're, I mean, we're there now. I mean, we're, we're there now. I mean, you know, this, this coronavirus thing aside, um, we were energy independent. You know, if, if one day the Saudis said, Hey, you know, we're not, we're not, um, we're not going to send you any oil anymore. We go, okay, fine. You know, we got enough oil here. So, um, we were actually, we kind of became a net ex a net exporter by a little bit. And that's something that, that, that President Obama had actually allowed because it was illegal for oil companies to sell U.S. oil overseas. So Obama was, mm. the one, yeah, so Obama was the one who actually said, no, wait a minute now, come on. Yeah. Like why, why take Alaska oil? Why not just take it directly to Japan or something? Why ship it all, all the way down here? Just because there's, there's an old law that dates back to, you know, 1973 or whatever. So, um, so, you know, theoretically, well, not theoretically, in actual fact, we are energy independent right now in, in you know, what I mean, in, in terms of our demand and what we can supply. That's good to know. Definitely good to know. I'm about to open this up to see if anybody might have any questions. Hello, do anybody have any questions? Thanks. Yes. Yeah, this is uh, D2. Hey, D2. The, um, Dave, thank you for your um, excellent presentation. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, ask you um, some questions about um, 
where do you, where do you see the opportunity for building uh, more refineries um, in the U.S.? And then what about, um, I know for some government agencies, well, for small businesses, in order to get set aside, you know, they have to get their, um, their product from a small refinery. Um, you know, that has, you know, um, kind of hampered the, um, the um, small business set aside program. Um, do you have any uh, creative ideas or thoughts about how that either will they get rid of the small uh, manufacturing rule uh, to create more competition and let small um, businesses, you know, compete? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about refining D2, but um, I, I, you know, of course, most of the refining is, is on the Gulf Coast here. That's the, the, you know, the Cushing hub is what feeds the refineries down here. Of course, you've got refineries out in the Bay Area and down in LA and then on and, and a little bit in the East Coast. But um, no, I mean, look, the smaller refineries, I think, again, it's like that the kind of distributive renewables. I think incentivizing smaller refineries is great. Um, we've actually had a bit of a bottleneck in uh, West Texas with pipeline capacity and then also, you know, kind of refining capacity as well. So I think that um, incentivizing, um, you know, investors to, to go ahead and, and, and look at more uh, kind of boutique, if you will, uh, refining, I, I think is a great idea. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, there's an example of maybe where you could incentivize something like that, um, you know, to, to kind of get that spread around. I, I think that that would be good. Does that kind of answer your question a little bit or uh, am I on the right track? Or <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're, you're on the um, right track. Um, you know, it's really interesting um, that, you know, there's uh, for the small manufacturing rule um, and for the set aside rule, um, the opportunity is there, but, um, until we get some, I don't think they've built any new refineries in the past 25 years, right? Or 10, right. something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the law, um, there's a, a set aside for historically black colleges mm. um, to, you know, um, participate in government contracts mm. um, around petroleum. Um, but there's not a lot of historically black colleges that actually participate. So it seems like something that that's, that they've set aside. Hmm. Um, but, you know, the historically black colleges haven't found a way to um, explore um, that piece. Maybe because they're not located, you know, um, close to areas where they really have that opportunity. It, it's possible. It's possible. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, some of the universities, um, are, and Jason knows this from that film he watched, that some of the universities, they, they are very sensitive about investing in, you know, fossil fuels, um, you know, and, and, and so I think that if, uh, if, a, if a historically, you know, a college, a black college were to do that, I think they would have to tread carefully. I think it would have to be, you know, in some innovative way, I think if you could come up with a design that would be more green. So in other words, you know, we in the industry struggle with flaring. Flaring is not a good thing and we don't like to do it and we do everything we can not to, but we still end up doing it in some cases. And there's also something called fugitive emissions that leak from around, you know, these, these valves that transport oil and gas. So if you could come up with a, a very innovative solution technology to, you know, actually make a uh, construct um, a refinery. I think that would be awesome. I think it would be absolutely fantastic. Any uh, other Any other questions? With that being said, um, I want to say thank you again, David, Dave, for spending your time with us. I know that you're in Texas. You. Uh, I definitely appreciate it. I want to say thank you again uh, for that. 
next week, I will have Norm Shriver uh, on the webinar. He will be discussing uh, how to live overseas as an expat or a patriot leaving the United States, how to leave, leave, uh, live overseas. Uh, once again, Dave, thank you for this call. Thank you for everybody getting on this webinar tonight. Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you, Jason, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, Dave. Thank Great good evening. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Mm -hmm.